Perfect. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the second in our series of webinars for District 50, Instructional Preparedness, What Will It mm -hmm. Look Like? And how can I be ready? Today, our focus will be on instructional practices and formative assessment. We um, honestly don't really know what the fall is going to look like. So that's part of the reason that we're doing these um, webinars mm -hmm. uh, to start working on some plans for the fall. We could advance the slide. We're hoping that you all will feel like this. So we've been spending a lot of time over the last year in curriculum boot camp, and as the year has gone on, um, working on common formative assessments along with our standards uh, aligned curriculum. Um, Lisa will be talking to us today. If we can go to the panel page. You are all familiar with Lisa Westman. She's been with us for the last several years working on student driven, student -driven differentiation um, based on formative assessments. And so she'll be talking about some instructional strategies uh, today in line with formative assessment. Um, and, and the focus will be on multi-purpose instructional strategies. So regardless of your grade level or content area, these are high quality, big bang for our buck instructional strategies that can be used in pretty much any classroom in the district. Also joining us today is Sarah Wargaski, who is our team lead for our instructional coaches. Um, their work this year has been an amazing success, better than I think any of us could have ever thought it would be at its inception just two years ago. Um, and so she is our team lead for that. She's going to talk about how our instructional coaches can continue to help you through curriculum boot camp and into the fall with these instructional strategies that Lisa will be talking about, again, with formative assessment, um, pretty much anything you need. We try to make our instructional coaches one-stop shopping. Um, and if we can move into um, then reviewing what we've already done and where we're going in this series of webinars for the district. On May 4th, we talked about the district philosophy and planning for next fall. As I mentioned, you know, no one really knows what the fall is going to look like. Um, so we have started drafting plans for A, B, C, and probably up through Z by now. Um, we don't know if we will be back in session as we normally would attend school. Um, with everyone present in live instruction, that's probably unlikely. Um, it could be a combination of live instruction and maybe live streaming. Um, half of the kids, it could be one day kids attend live instruction, the next day kids work, that same group works independently at home. We just really don't know what it looks like. Our worst fear, of course, would be that we at some point in the fall are not able to be in any kind of attendance in district and would again be delivering complete remote instruction um, but this time we would have to be delivering live and up to date and current standards and current instruction, new instruction, um, rather than uh, practicing things that we had already covered. Uh, obviously with it being the fall, there will be a lot of new material to cover. And so we wanna spend this time through the summer better preparing ourselves and all staff for the delivery methods we'll be looking at. And then again, those instructional strategies and assessment that we're covering today. And we will wrap up our series of webinars um, on Thursday at the same time, um, covering the instructional resources that we have available in district. And that will be John Hummel, myself, Amber Bogren, and Joyce Gronwald, along with Jason Eggert, who works with us on our Admentum products in district. And we'll be talking about the instructional resources that we have available. We know that a lot of people have taken part in free trials and expanded their repertoire of materials through that process. Um, but we'll also be looking to coming back to the, the district resources that we have in place and available to you um, and talking about the accessibility of many of them for our special ed students who need some additional accommodations with our resources as well as those bilingual resources uh, that we have available for our students. And so moving on to today's um, overview and presentation uh, on instructional practices and formative assessment. One of the big pieces that we will be talking about throughout the summer and any PD that we do will be on planning for our nine, our nine week quarters through the school year. We will be looking to break those probably more so into the three, three week instructional pieces that we're looking at using the summer in our SOAR program because that will give us flexibility should we have to start in one plan, plan B, for example, and then have to go to completely remote. Ideally, 
those quarters will have already been semi-planned out for you. And so picking up quickly from a new method of delivering instruction would be a little easier along the way is our hope um, by breaking into three three-week cycles. And when we start talking about those instructional cycles, we're talking about those pieces of instruction, stopping along the way, delivering that form of assessment as a check for where the students are. Do you need to go back and reteach? Are we good? Are we ready to move on? Or do you have just a few kids that need some additional pieces of instruction to really master those standards? Again, a reminder that we have our instructional coaches always willing and able to help you on any topic that you have instructionally. Um, and so be sure to reach out and Sarah's going to talk about that reaching out and collaboration that will again continue through the summer and into the fall. And with that, I'm going to turn today's presentation over to Lisa Westman. She is going to talk about, again, as I mentioned, some instructional strategies um, that can be used in any classroom and any content area across the district. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction, Mary. Um, if you all are watching at home and have questions, go ahead and put those into the chat feature and Sarah and, and or Mary or Guy will stop me um, throughout the presentation if there are things that they need to clarify or things that you would like me to elaborate on. And then at the end, we'll have more time for me to answer some questions uh, right before Sarah gets on. So um, I thought I'd take you a little back in time. Uh, we've all been doing remote learning for about eight to nine weeks now, depending on um, the exact day that your school's closed. For me and my children at home personally, March 16th was our first day of remote learning. And not only did I have my 11-year-old daughter and my 14-year-old son, who you can barely see because he didn't want to join me, I also had my three nephews for the first couple of days. So I had an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, a three-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 14-year-old. And I was like, this is gonna be great. I finally get to teach my own children. I'm gonna have the best lessons. This is gonna be amazing. And I was basically Mary Poppins until about hour four and I turned into Mrs. Hannigan. And I was like, this is never going to work. Um, four hours in is an experienced educator trying to teach five children pretty much wiped me out. And what I did in the beginning was really focus on trying to keep my own kids busy. And it seemed like that was the default. That was all that we could do at the time. We were pushed into this remote learning situation very quickly without a lot of warning. And we really focused on keeping our students, our children busy. In fact, on the Today Show, at the end of March, they were advertising websites to occupy kids. But as Mary said, as we move into the next school year, which we're likely to have some form of remote learning, whether it's you know half and half or as she said, our worst fear, but an entirely remote situation, what we really need to do is focus on learning over doing. And so what we're going to talk about today are some instructional strategies and formative assessment types and ideas that focus on learning and whether we are in person or remote, what I am going to share with you today will work in any environment. The most important thing that we all need to focus on is a sense of belonging. I'll read you only one quote today, but the need to belong among others is a fundamental human motive. People feel capable and of worth when they feel a sense of belonging. Our students' self-esteem and our own self-esteem is directly related to feeling part of a group. In person, educators, we all strive to make sure that our students and our colleagues feel a sense of belonging. And sometimes that can prove difficult even in person. When we're not in person, it can be even more difficult. So I, what I want to focus on first and foremost throughout everything that I share today is how do we create that community, that sense of belonging, that environment, that connectedness that we all need in order to learn and feel good. And the way that we do that in part is through differentiation. I feel fortunate to have worked with, I think almost everybody in Harvard currently. So most of you have seen the slide that I have up on the screen right now, which is the cover of my book, which many of you have a copy of, and then also the four pillars of differentiation, 
which are really just the four pillars of SALAD instruction and, and assessment. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about each of those pillars as we go on today. This is Caroline Tomlinson. If you're not familiar with her, she is my colleague and my mentor. She is the foremost thought leader in differentiation. And um, if you watch any video with Carol or you read anything that she has written, and she has written many, many things, she will always say, formative assessment is the lifeblood of differentiation. So everything that we are talking about today will come back to formative assessment, which really just means how do we know how our students are doing. And what I say we need to assess on first in any environment, but especially in this remote environment, is assess for connection. And we can do that by asking our, quest our students one question. How do you feel? That will elicit a variety of responses, happy, sad, bored, eager, whatever the case may be. And we can use that, how do you feel, that connection piece to then form our small groups. In small groups, I'll talk more about what that looks like in remote learning, but we can start to join students together. Perhaps you have a student who's bored and a student who's lonely. Boredom is often a response that students say when they feel lonely or they need more interaction. So using how students feel to put them in small groups is another way that we can differentiate for what our students need. Otherwise known as differentiating for the learning environment. So in that earlier slide, there are four different pillars of differentiation. The first is that learning environment, the culture and climate of student and teacher interaction. I'm not going to read to you what's on these slides and that I will make them accessible to you after. So you can go ahead and read as I am talking, but really when we're talking about this learning environment, we're talking about how we group students together and how we determine who's going to be in those groups. All of the social emotional pieces, the metacognitive pieces, all of that falls into the learning environment. So in order for any learning to take place, for any instruction to be valuable and effective, there must be a very strong, solid learning community or learning environment. I showed you in, in the last slide that you can have students hold up a piece of paper with answers. They can do that for any questions. There's a variety of whiteboard apps that you can use with Zoom or Google Meet. You can also create your own um, whiteboards with students. It's a little fun activity. If you want, you can ask students if they have old DVD cases or probably if their parents do. You can take out the cover for the movie, have the students ask their parents first, take the inside out, turn it around so the white part is showing and you have a homemade whiteboard. And maybe you can you know, deliver whiteboard markers at the beginning of the year or deliver old DVD cases. It's super fun. It's no different really than using a piece of paper, but the students think it's pretty cool. There is also lots of other ways to assess for students understanding while you're in a virtual environment, learning environment or in person. So holding up two different red and green. It can be you know, index cards, it can be a red marker and a green marker, it can be thumbs up, thumbs down, scale fist to five. All of these formative assessment strategies that we've talked about in person work exceptionally well in a virtual environment where you need to get a, an idea quickly of where your students are at and without a lot of talking because having 20 something students or even five students talking at one time in Zoom doesn't really work well. Um, other things that you can use within your Zoom classroom are the chat features. So you can have students put their answers right into the chat. The great thing about that is you have a running record of where students are at. And again, you can use all of this information to then form smaller groups later. The second category of differentiation is content. Content is what students learn. This is the huge, huge piece. Again, I'll let you read what's on the screen. And if I go too quickly, I'll make this all accessible to you later. But the content is really determined by the skills and the standards that are derived from the, the skills and concepts that are derived from the standards, the Common Core standards, NGSS standards, the Performing Arts standards, which is what you have all decided upon, agreed on your essential standards. That's what you're doing in all of your curriculum planning boot camps and in your PLCs. 
And I have a variety of activities that I'm about to show you to help differentiate that content. What we really need to do is ensure that we engage our students. Engagement is a very um, popular term that a lot of educators will use. I want my students to be engaged. So for our purposes, let me define engaged as students understand what it is that they are learning and the relevancy of it, why it is important. The students don't have to love every content area. It's nice if they do, but they certainly have to understand the importance of what they're learning. In my book, step two of planning for differentiation is hooking the students. So while you're planning instruction, you're asking yourself as a facilitator of the learning, why is this relevant? Why is this important? So what I wanna do now is show you a bunch of ways to make the content relevant for students. First and foremost, find learning opportunities everywhere. So everything that you see somewhere is possible, it's possible to bring that into your classroom virtually or in person. So several weeks ago, I saw this picture on Twitter, what's wrong with this? I knew it had something to do with math. I'm not 100% sure at the time, but I knew that all of the math teachers out there would be able to answer this. And so as a math teacher to present this to your students, which I later asked someone I know who teaches math, something to do with the Pythagorean theorem, you know this math people, but this is something that you want to draw your students in. So again, beginning of class, you're showing them this tweet. So what is wrong with this picture? You go back to those techniques I showed you earlier with the students writing on their, their whiteboards or you're using a digital whiteboard or whatever techniques you have, and then you break into your lesson on Pythagorean theorem. Current events are a great way to get started, great hooks. I saw this actually this morning, I think it was um, published a couple days ago and the article is not very helpful, but I found it to be quite alarming that almost every city and state and country for that matter around the world, one of the benefits they've seen of the quarantine, the stay at home order is that the environment has improved, except Chicago has not had that. Why, I don't know, but it may be a great, again, hook intro to your lesson to engage your students. Interdisciplinary learning opportunities are really, really, really something I encourage in a traditional classroom, but especially now for our middle and high school students who have lots and lots of different classes to have two teachers or three teachers, three content areas join together to create a learning opportunity. One gives you assessment data for multiple courses, but two lessens the load for both teachers and students. So this was um, apparently on TikTok about a month or month and a half ago, quite the rage, which was students or kids going outside and putting masking tape or painting tape on the sidewalk, coloring it in, removing the tape, and you have this beautiful picture. So you have an art opportunity and certainly a geometry opportunity at several different grade levels, again, depending on what those predetermined standards that you have. Another interdisciplinary and relevant idea, I saw this a couple of weeks ago. Um, there are some doctors that came up with, you can read the little part that I took out, a way to use one test for COVID to test five different people. And this is a science and a math and a social studies learning opportunity because they got this idea from looking back at something that happened during World War II and then you know, making more use out of one test. Lastly, what I'll share with you, and this is an example from another district, and then my next slide is one specific for your district, is an essential standards influence scavenger hunt. So again, as I mentioned earlier, and as you've all been working on, you've chosen your essential standards at each grade level for each content area. And the standards in them of themselves can seem somewhat sterile and unappealing if you don't have that draw for the students. So a great way to start out a lesson is you know what your standard is, choose your standard, and then when you have your whole class meet for your first in-person, you know, live together session, have them go, your students go on a scavenger hunt to find something. So for example, um, if I'm first grade math, I could say in one minute, gather as many objects as you can, I'm going to as well, when we come back 
to our tables, to our seats, we're all gonna add up how many objects that we have. Now, as the teacher, I would then say, oh, Sarah, what did you bring today? Oh, Sarah brought markers. Oh, Mary, what did you bring? Oh, Mary brought M&Ms. Oh, I want some of those M&Ms. We're gonna talk about it. Get to know the kids. Again, we're forming this community. It's okay to take longer having those conversations and not get right to the heart of what you're teaching just to get everybody on board. This is a time to just enjoy building those relationships. But then when you're done with that, it's okay. So if I add together Sarah's markers and Mary's M&Ms with my post-its, how many objects do we have all together? Because I know the standard that I'm going to be instructing, the learning target from that standard has to do with adding things together. So again, this is an example from another district with other um, standards. This is specific to Harvard. Mary shared with me just a sampling of essential standards at various grade levels in various content areas. By no means does this represent everyone or are these the only ideas, but what I did was I just put together one scavenger hunt item per grade level per essential standard. So you could take a look at what that might look like and, and just wrap your heads around that. So I'll give you just a minute to look at these. Again, I will make these slides available to you later so you'll have access to them. The third pillar of differentiation is the process. Process is how students acquire learning. In a traditional classroom, we may have some students using a graphic organizer and some students writing on index cards, or we may have some students writing paper and pencil and other students using some type of word processing. All of those systems and processes still apply in a virtual environment, but there are additional considerations that we must take when we are um, determining how to differentiate the process for our students. I saw this meme um, on Facebook. One of my teacher friends shared this a few weeks back. I had another teacher friend call me over the weekend and say, my students don't read directions. They literally just clicked on. And I remember thinking like, why would they do that? Like, why would they just click done? Maybe they don't think they're. And then this morning I got an email from my own son's eighth grade math teacher saying, Keller hasn't done any of his math for the entire remote learning. When I looked, it said they were all done, but he just clicked on. So what's going on? One of the things we need to do is differentiate the way that we provide students with instructions. So for Lisa, instance, can I stop you at this oh, just sure. question from the audience? Absolutely. Um, and actually it was piggybacked by another grade level as well. So Shauna Paseniak at kindergarten said, Lisa, I would love to pick your brain on how to do all this with incoming kinders who have not used technology before. And Valerie from Washington said that she, that question would apply to pre-K as well. So that's a great question. So let me just ask a follow-up question. I know this is hard because there, there's the medium, but are we talking about the incoming students for next year who have not had exposure to using devices? That, yes. So those kids that would be beginning kindergarten next fall and so, incoming pre-K students next fall as well. So will those students have devices delivered to their homes? Is that what the plan is? No, they kindergartners, not starting kindergartners, kindergartners would have um, the devices just as they do this year. So the incoming kinders would would receive devices as well. And um, part of our discussions would be um, pre-K students potentially having iPads. OK, so the first thing is ideally we can teach our students how to use these devices in person. So ideally, we will have some contact time and the kindergarten and pre-K teachers are side by side or six feet away from their students showing them how to use 
the different devices. If that is not a possibility and we have to teach that piece remotely, I, as of right now, the only way I know how to do that is via video. Actually, my next slide is also about using video. We need to walk students through things very, very slowly. So we have pre-recorded videos. Today, we're going to talk about how to get onto Google Classroom. And we should assess on that. So all we're gonna do is get on Google Classroom and you're going to do X. Any student who doesn't do X, which I would say make it like a Google form or take a picture of yourself, whatever it's going to be, we need to follow up with those students individually, maybe even set up Zooms with small groups or um, individual students to do that. The parents will have to know when those things are. So one of the things that we have to do is have is accessible communication and clear communication when students are doing what and how they access that. This is just a screenshot of one teacher's, um, she has a Google Classroom, which also has a Google site. And she puts everything on the Google site because she's found that it's easier for her students and their parents to navigate the site rather than the Google Classroom because parents can't see all of the student work in the Google Classroom unless they're logged on as their students, but they can see what you know Ms. Smith calls her roadmap in the Google site. I can show you how to do those types of things or your coaches can certainly show you how to do those things, not during the webinar. But to answer those questions, um, Mary, that you shared, recorded videos or very small groups in person, just focus on using the tools first and limit. I cannot express this enough. I know, as Mary said earlier, there's lots of tools that people are using. Too many is not a good thing. And if you think about how many tools you're using and you have one child in a family, if they have two siblings and multiple other teachers with multiple tools, it can be a lot to manage. So we want to find a few things that do what we need very well and then leave it at that. So if there's something that you're wanting to do, I would reach out to a coach and see what the best you know, district recommended tool is for that. Any other questions, Mary, before I go on? There was a quick follow up to that about what if some parents aren't home and they're working, but I believe that came in because of our little delay. I believe you addressed that um, when you talked about scheduling um, and working with the parents for when they would be available. Yeah, and that's that's the advantage of having the, the recorded lessons is that when the students go through that with their parents, they can do it at a convenient time for them. I really haven't figured out the best thing yet for eliminating parents completely from the kindergarten and first grade and pre-K learning. I think in the beginning, if we can get the students very self-sufficient with the tools, that will naturally happen. And then again, having those clear schedules. So even maybe saying to parents, we really need your help this first week. And then we want the students to be able to do this on their own because the most important thing is making this remote learning sustainable for students for parents and for all of you. And we really, we cannot have the parents be like co-teachers with us. It just won't, it's not sustainable realistically. Anything else for now? Should I go on, Mary? I think we can go on. Thanks, Lisa. Sure. Um, to keep with the note of video learning, if students are not reading directions, if you have a set of directions on your Google Classroom or Google site and students are not reading all of them, or they're forgetting steps, another solution to that is recording yourself reading those directions. So step one, click on blank Google Doc or whatever it is. When the students are supposed to pause and do that in your video, say, pause the video now and come back after you complete that step. When you restart the video, it's, you must have just completed this step, good job. Your next step is, this and then pause the video again. And I know it seems kind of silly to stay in your video, now pause the video and come back, but it really can help to differentiate that process for the students that are struggling to follow the directions as you have them written. So perhaps a student that struggles with executive functioning or organization, something like that. The last pillar of differentiation is the product. So that's how students demonstrate their learning, otherwise known as 
assessment. This is the most important thing when we come back and things will look a little bit different because again, this is when we are going to be teaching new topics, new skills, new standards to students. And we are still accountable for the students learning and growing, even though we are in a much more um, rigorous learning environment for all of us. So some things to focus on with assessment are authentic examples of learning. So having students create something or do things to show their learning that makes sense. So for instance, if you're talking about area and perimeter, instead of having students do 10 problems in a worksheet, have them find the area or perimeter of a room in their house or something in their neighborhood, something like that. Do not worry about grading everything. In fact, what I say that you should grade are only the things that you are confident that you are getting reliable information. So if you are asking students to do something, do this at home and then turn it in, those are the pieces that are less likely to give us reliable information if students are doing them at home because some students will have parents that help them with it. Some students will have parents that do it for them. Some students will not have parents to help them at all. So how do we really know how students are doing? That's through that formative assessment directly with us. So entrance tickets, exit tickets, Google forms that the students complete while they're with you in class. What you're looking to have students do is show you their evidence of learning and then be prepared for the next lesson. So if we read a story and I say to my students, what I want you to do is come to the class next time and be prepared to tell me the theme of your quarantine. So our skill or our standard that we've gone over is identifying theme and story. We've had practice. What I want to see when I start my next lesson is, do students even understand what theme is, right? And so I have put, just made this up, but my students would find a picture come to class, that's your entrance ticket, something that represents the theme of their life. That's how I can get some formative assessment data and I can also do some small groups. If I ask my students to read a bunch of things at home and answer some multiple choice questions, I can certainly look at that data and see where my students are at, but I need to couple with that with the information that I'm getting live from my students so that I know it's really where they are functioning. You will be introduced in a few days to some of the other tools through Edmentum. Those are solid pieces to have your students take because there's time limits on there. You can see how much time they've spent. Those standards are, or those assessments are aligned to the standards that you've chosen. We want to avoid the packets of worksheets that you're printing out or having students do, again, to keep them busy. The last thing I'll say on that is if you give students a huge packet of information that they, or packet of questions that they fill out and they practice incorrectly. So they aren't doing that with somebody by their side that's going to give them the feedback. We run the risk of having the students practice a skill incorrectly and then we have to unteach it, which is harder than teaching it the first time. So less is more, targeted, short assessments. Google Forms are something you can create in your classroom. So this is an example of a teacher creating a Google form just on the Genius Hour, getting her data to help form her groups. Those work really well. Again, everything that you're doing is aligned to your essential standards as you've determined them. All of this, all of this formative assessment and seeing where students are at, the biggest shift that we're going to have to keep in our heads is we are no longer focused on grading in a way that we've graded in the past. It's almost impossible to do that. Instead, what we have to do is assess students on where they are in relation to the skills or standards that we are assessing. As identified in your essential standards, these are just two examples from other districts, but on the left, this is an example of a rubric that you fill out. The student has no evidence of the standard. They're approaching the standard or they've met the standard. What I have on the right is a single point rubric. Many of you have seen this if you've worked with me. All of the learning intentions on the left, each of those check boxes is one of the success criteria the students must demonstrate to show mastery. So I can give my students very specific feedback 
you haven't met this standard yet because you have not clearly introduced your characters in a compelling way. Giving you feedback, the students go back and revise. What that looks like in a grade book format is keeping track of where the students are at. They've met the standard, they haven't met the standard. So there's lots of ways to manipulate your grade book and we're not, there's no systematic way that you have to do this in Harvard. But what you can start thinking about right now is how do I move away from this seven out of 10, six out of 10, eight out of 10, which doesn't give me any real information to inform my next lessons and certainly doesn't give my students the most important thing that we can do with all of this, which is giving them effective feedback. So what I always say is feedback is the new grades, like orange is the new black. Want to focus on feedback, less on grades. Feedback in and of itself is a way that you can differentiate for students. We often feel like things all have to be equal. So if I have 20 students, I need to meet with them in small groups for the same number of minutes on the same number of days, and that could not be further from the truth. The students who are at, who are at the beginning of their learning, so the concept or the skill is new to them, they need task-related feedback. Right, wrong, yes, no, stop, go. Students at this level in their learning need more frequent, shorter amounts of interaction with their teacher to move forward, as opposed to the highest level, which are students who really already are very deep into this learning and can almost regulate where they need to go themselves. So they can see when something isn't making sense and they can back up themselves. Those students do not need to have interaction with their teacher in a small group every day. They don't need that right, wrong, yes, no feedback. In fact, it can be detrimental to their learning. It holds them back. What they need instead is, what would happen if you did this? Or I wonder if this connects to another concept we've been learning, prompts to get them to go further. So again, I'll leave this up there. Some of you have seen this already, but when we're thinking about having how we set up our small groups in our classes moving forward, you wanna have that, you wanna build connection for everybody. So you want that whole group time you come in, maybe you do your scavenger hunt, you do your, your um, morning meeting, whatever that is. Then you have your small groups that you form in a variety of ways, both academically and social emotionally. And for those students who are at that lower level of learning, more frequent small groups than the students who are not at that level, who are deeper, you maybe see them once or twice for a little bit longer time. You do not need to have equal time for every student. You need to give the students what they need. So on that note, I know we have a little time for Q&A for me, and then we're gonna go jump back to Sarah. I don't know if there's other questions, Mary or Sarah, that have been posted in there. There are no new questions in here now, but since you put out for questions, we'll wait just for a minute and see. Um, one just popped up from Christy Juarez. Would you suggest videotaping all lessons so parents can access them at whatever time of day they can find to help their children? That's a great question. I would say yes. So what I would do is I would record or pre-record lessons as frequently as possible. Or if it's middle or high school and the students have multiple classes and are joining different classes at different times, you can live stream the class and then there's a recording of that where then you can either join that class live or watch it at a later time. What I would also recommend is if you are a middle or high school teacher or even elementary, anyone who's teaching the same content at the same grade level, you only need one recorded lesson. So if there's five fourth grade teachers, everyone doesn't need to record the lesson on multiplication. One recorded lesson that all fourth graders can watch. Thank you, Lisa. There's also one question uh, from Deb Garza in here that said, what about our SPED kiddos? But because of the delay, I am not 100% certain what aspect of what you had presented she was referring to. So we'll save that for the end and come back to that. Okay, I'm gonna switch back over to the other presentation. So um, Sarah can jump in now.
All right, everyone. Nice to um, talk with you today. I can't see you, but um, nice to be here. And really, this is just a quick reminder um, that we are here for you. Um, Mary and Lisa mentioned several ways throughout um, that we can assist you as we move into the summer and the start of next fall um, in whatever scenario um, it might be. So just remember throughout all of it, our role is to partner with you. Um, you can always contact us individually, or if you're not sure who to contact, feel free to email our general coaching email, coaching at cusd50.org. And um, we will reach out to you. One of us will be in contact with you as soon as we can. Um, additionally, on the next slide, we wanna remind you of a couple of resources. <clears throat> that on the staff intranet, if you click on the e-learning resources slideshow, this is where we've started, we, we started to put all of our resources in one place. There are active links for this table of contents that you can click through to find things that you need. Or if you use control F or find, you could search for something if you're um, not sure which um, section of this slideshow it might be in. Um, one more resource is our YouTube page. Um, we have all of our um, Quick as a Bee PDs in there. Please know that as we get requests or help, how do I do this? We will create videos and add them in there to share with others. So never be um, shy about asking for um, some support or um, um, suggesting a video that would be useful for you. And jumping on to adding videos at a moment's notice to the YouTube page, John did create one that has been in high demand um, in recent weeks uh, regarding using Zoom and breaking into the small group rooms. Um, and so that he just created and that will be on the instructional coaches page uh, as soon as possible. So we will turn it back over to you audience for any other remaining questions for Lisa or Sarah or myself. Lots of kudos for the coaches are showing up on the chat, which is awesome. We'll give everybody just another minute or two to come back in with any questions. During that time, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, um, I'll just remind everyone that we will be back again on Thursday at 1.30. Um, same format, uh, YouTube Live, and we'll be presenting via Zoom on the instructional resources that we have available to all of you in the district um, and ideas on collaborating between the instructional strategies that Lisa brought up today and pairing them with our instructional resources that are available. Also, if you go back and look at that district webpage um, under the internet, there is that list list of um, instructional resources that we have accumulated during the time of remote learning, as well as the coaches um, teachers hub that they created, which has organized that long list of instructional resources into a little bit more manageable and searchable process. Is there a place for parents to access tutorials on how to use Zoom, et cetera? We don't currently have that available, but we could certainly look to do something like that. Zoom what do we do about students who do not participate at all? Participate meaning turning things in or showing up to the sessions? I would guess both, a little bit of each. So, If students are not doing either, in a traditional school environment, we would do like a well being visit, right? So if we have no evidence that these students are participating, they're not coming to class, they're not turning anything in, that's concerning because we don't know what's going on. So we, I'm sure your district will have some policies in place to check on those students first and foremost. This year, the state of Illinois made the, um, live sessions optional for teachers and students. 
It is my greatest hope that moving forward for districts that have the capacity, meaning that their students have devices and their students have access to Wi-Fi, that those sessions are not optional. And so it is my hope that those live sessions are treated like a school day. It's not optional to go to school. It's not optional to have that live instruction. And so if a student isn't there, again, it's like a truancy piece or we're finding out what's happening. If a student is not turning things in, that's a different story. Again, we should have less that they turn in and more that they come to class prepared to share or to show us so that we have an idea of where they're at. If a student does two problems in class and shows you that they understand something, that's your formative assessment and they don't do the 15 problems at home, they probably don't need to do that. And that's where we have those longer assessments that you're likely going to offer through Edmentum to see to how students are doing. And then there has to be some accountability piece in there. I never have thought prior to remote learning that failure is a, is a solid option for saying, you no know, student didn't do anything. I much prefer seeing insufficient evidence. If a student really doesn't turn anything in and is not producing anything in class, we're doing the best we can on our end to elicit that. But if we aren't getting something from the students, we have insufficient evidence to say where they are at in relationship to those skills or standards. And that's what we need to communicate to parents and to the students. Thanks, Lisa. There was one further question um, for the district. What is the plan to get all families to do e-learning or is that impossible? We're hoping it's not impossible. And we have been addressing issues as often as we learn of them, particularly the lack of available Wi-Fi or internet service at homes. Um, we have to date distributed nearly 200 hotspots that we've been able to get with grant funds and our technology budget. So we, as we learn of issues that are impeding students' ability to participate, we are doing our best to take care of that. If they have an issue with their Chromebook, if they contact the district office, we make sure that we reissue a new one. Um, if there's something wrong with their charger, we make sure that they get a new one. Um, so through contact with classroom teachers, that is the way, the most direct way that we can quickly get students on board and going as quick as possible. And so with that, um, there will be a link to today's presentation. It will be living on our YouTube page in district. As Lisa mentioned, she is going to share the materials that she presented and we will get that out to the entire district. So once again, I'd like to thank Lisa Westman for joining us today. Um, it's always great to have you with us, Lisa, so thank you. Yes. Uh, Sarah, thank you for your presentation on the instructional coaches and thank you all for attending and we will see you on Thursday. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye.